as you can see, it's a few years ago, but it just, <laughs> it was like, it was exactly like that, like a set piece. And that is a definite sort of combination that I have that these are, these are objects, yes, but they're also props, but they're also set pieces that I'm in and dwelling in and people can go in also. One thing that I wanna talk about in where I wanna go with my work is I really wanna bring in an aspect of performance. I, I, don't, I haven't quite figured it out, um, <laughs> but I think that it would be a really exciting uh, direction to go and use these sculptures as a means to express another aspect of um, my own uh, our artistic thing. <laughs> um, next slide, please. Fish wheel. This was another one of the interactive sculptures. And, and again, kids were drawn to this like crazy. As you can see, it's the playfulness of the piece. This fish wheel where they go around and around. And it mes it's mesmerizing because after a while you get the momentum and then it's kind of spinning your hands. And there's a kind of meditative re repetition, uh, ritual, you know, um, bowing your head or kneeling or praying. It's this sort of continual um, pattern, physical pattern that humans seem to crave. Post and beam, uh, mortise and tenon. Some pieces are found, some pie pieces were created. Uh, I welded the whole frame. And this is actually in, um, on Castleton's campus. Next slide. Baggage installation. This was a fun piece. This uh, I, I collected suitcases. I had no idea why, but I just loved all the different sort of older suitcases. And then in this piece, what I did is that I filled each one with some odd combination of things, uh, a, a map of Florence, which relates to, to myself. That's where I met my former wife. So each one of these, there were personal aspects to myself, but there were also these just odd narratives, you weren't quite sure. I left some of the suitcases open and some of them were closed. And what was fascinating to see again was who decided that maybe they mean that you can open the suitcases. And that pushing past those sort of boundaries of convention to discover more, to discover more or to discover what's happening behind or, or find out more information, I think is just like the key to human beings, always sort of trying to understand and learn more and sometimes it feels like there's so many rules that you can't go past that so this was kind of like again to instill curiosity what's in this strange fuzzy green suitcase next slide yeah so here are some of the uh details and uh, this was a bottle of sand from the western desert in egypt when i visited my brother uh the one on the top there were desiccated animals that were either flattened, but I just started to collect them. This dead spider, this mouse was beautiful, so intricate. This dried out frog, it was like a frog mummy. This flattened snake. Um, I loved how they were all sort of together in this suitcase. Next slide. Yeah, so some more details. Go ahead, next slide. These are good examples of found objects coming together. Hydraulic forum. It, honestly, what I started to do was just gather together all these different objects that related to water one way or the other. A fire hose, uh, the cover of a, a, a water shutoff valve, uh, faucets, lots of different faucets, um, uh, um, the spray nozzles that come down for a sprinkler system just a regular hose that you have in your backyard. And I think what I was playing around with, not just the forms and the shapes and how they came together, but also this idea that water just like, it makes me extremely nervous. Clean water, it's, it's gonna be harder and harder to find. And this idea of hydraulic quorum, a quorum is you need at least four people within a group uh, to be able to pass any sort of law. And it just feels like it's getting tighter and tighter and tighter when it comes to that. Lay down your burden. It all started with the exhaust um, manifold of a car I found at a junkyard. And from there, it slowly grew. You have that pendulum manner shape again. Uh, it's on a sort of seesaw, and then you can push that brass button, and it's almost like it's Morse code. And I have this little piece of paper that spells out what le letters or what tapping sequence. So it's almost like you're, you're tapping a message away to some who knows where 
it's going. But at the same time, as you're tapping it, that pendulum, that heavy pendulum, starts making it so you are tapping something else. It is making you tap this message. You don't know who is. Just like in Helm, you don't know who is spinning that Helm. Is it you or is it the actual object or sculpture itself that's making you spin? Next slide. Wall of circles. I love this just because it's just joyous. And uh, I, I, it, what I found interesting is that the, the um, uh, older people and younger people loved this piece. There were uh, drumsticks and you could just wail away on this thing and spin the wheels. And there was a game that they were, that some of them were trying was if you could spin all the wheels and have them spinning, oops, all at the same time, and then be making all the noise for else. Cause you know, by the time one of them slows down, you're just starting on the next one. And then there's a dartboard where you can play darts. It's kind of ridiculous, but I also love the juxtaposition of all these circles together, all these different circles. They're all circles, but they're highly different. And even their original function has been altered and changed into this kind of symphony of circles. Next slide. Yeah, so found object, quite symmetrical. I'm playing around with the shape, the color, the material, and kind of in a way bringing this entity to life. I do feel like that. I feel like that, you know, bringing these, these items together and it becomes a whole and a new entity that has a personality, it has a feeling to it. I, I riff off of, um, you know, sea creatures, or in this case, almost like a butterfly, uh, acorn jug, I love the shadows in here. Each chain is made of a different material. One's ceramic, one's plastic, uh, one's actual metal chain. Go ahead, next slide. This piece I want to show more. This is an installation piece that I did for my mom, who is in the end stages of Alzheimer's. And I was luckily able to gather Many of her stories with her, it was a time where I, I, had, I had some free time and every morning we would take about half an hour to an hour and she would just tell me the stories of her childhood. So what you have in this room um, is her voice talking about her childhood. She, she grew up in Amsterdam uh, during the war and um, she just talks about what it was like to be in that world. She loves carpets and she had a tendency towards in her time of memory forgetfulness to layer carpet after carpet on top of carpet and then and then for some reason she loved linens and she had so many linens so what I did is I put linens all over the wall and so you feel like this cocoon inside this installation space again also pots and I filled some of the pots with water in different levels on the screen there's a continuous loop of this video of the sun shining through aspen saplings, very tiny leaves that the sun shone through. So it was this pure, pure green. <coughs> Excuse me. There's dripping that's happening in the background too. Drop, drop, drop of the memory that's slowly filling the bowl. Um, this is a very an emotional piece for me. I, that's me sitting in the chair. But that's what you, you walk into the place, the, the sound is controlled, the light is controlled, everything is kind of muffled. It feels like you're in a tent and you sit down and you're sort of mesmerized by this light that's filtering through the trees and listening to my mom's stories. <laughs> Next slide, please. Tupa collage. This was based off of a road trip I took with my girls in I think it was 2015. And it was for a family reunion. And the minute I crossed the border in Montana, which is where we were going, I started to pick up items off the ground. And pretty much everything that you see there came from that road trip. Uh, oh, you know what? There's a process series after this. So let's go to the next slide. This is kind of how it started. You know, these objects and the, the, the sort of base of it was the, I think it was the cushions on a motorboat I found in a dried out reservoir. And also that sort of half circle that was the top of an oil drum that I found. So I basically, 
this is how I sort of start these sculptures that I put one thing down, I put another thing down, see how it works, take it away, take a picture, remember it. And then it's this fluid sort of moving of all these different uh, parts to try to find how they interact and how they work best together. Next slide. Yeah, so that's, that was the base of it. It was like, okay, I got it. So I had all the objects and then I would do these sketches to try to see the best way of putting these together. Again, you have the rubber tire. I seem to really dig that. I like its extreme, uh, like dense blackness. Um, and then also with that dense blackness, you can pop color or uh, silver off of it. So you get this really great contrast. Above the compartments, I like the trinity of it, the three, the triptych, you know, traditional art history, like triptychs that you would see uh, in the Renaissance and you know, the religious uh, iconography. Next slide. So then I would start to build. I bring in these roots, these, uh, these uh, branches that came off of the jack pines um, on the Rocky Mountain front. And I love the way it looked like roots, even though they were branches coming, coming out of the bottom of this uh, 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 triptych. Next slide. Just wanted to show a detail here. This is an homage to H.C. Westerman, who is one of my idols, artistic idols. But he had this whole series of these death ships that he would cover with dollar bills. It's a gas pump. And you can kind of see the, the whole idea. It's maybe a little bit blunt but this whole idea of oil and, 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 and money and just what it's done to the Middle East and what it's done to the entire world. The Rocky Mountain Front is constantly being, um, they, they have exploratory drilling to try to see if there's gas or oil in there. It is a pristine, gorgeous, unbelievably spiritual place for Native Americans, but also for the people who live there and around. And so it's this constant struggle of fossil fuels, resources, and the beauty of our country and earth. Next slide. Yeah, so you can see I'm moving things around and I'm trying to figure out how they work best together. Next slide. Comes in the color schemes. I was playing around with black velvet. I love velvet. It also is, again, uh, touching on the idea of reliquary, you know, a, 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 a Christian church way of like showing this uh, uh, saint's bones as this holy thing. Uh, next slide. I start working for the color scheme and it relates, you can see it on the top left hand side, it relates to the actual uh, image that I have of my three daughters on this road trip, which if you, see, I think there's a picture of it, but I based those colors that I continued, uh, sorry, repeated within the actual piece that relates to the picture of my daughters. Next slide. Yeah, so that's the back of it, and that is the front before the items were placed. Go ahead. And that's all to it, that's, that's it all together. It's hard to see in this, the two horns on either side. And then the, the I tried to use the, the, the tube of the gas nozzle to bring you back around again. And so that it's this whole sort of, so you can see it's kind of, it is kind of like shrine-like in a way. And I love that visual language, like I've said before. It's just garbage. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, yeah, so this is an art and state buildings competition that I was involved in. And I just wanted to show th uh, this idea of this, again, it's a, it would be a large public art piece um, that I designed. I made a little maquette and that's what you're gonna see. Next slide. So these are some of my influences, excuse me, the Golden Dome on the State Building, Vermont State Building, uh, Capitol. Next slide. Uh, again, the dome, next slide. A stupa from Nepal, this shape. Continue. Uh, jungle Gym, so again, you have the playing. So what I'm doing is I'm building up all these different references and then you'll see what it actually looks like. Um, yeah, I mean, who didn't love a jungle gym? Next slide. And then of course the merry-go-round that really don't exist anymore on playgrounds because of uh, liability. But man, was that a lot of fun, especially when he got thrown off and he rolled as to the side and then he were like, for whatever reason, got back on again and jumped back on. Uh, next slide. And then Buckminster Fuller, his biodome. I mean, what an amazing man this guy is. Holy moly. 
again, another idol. Uh, read about this fellow. He is incredible. Next slide. Yeah, the beautiful biodome. So I wanted to combine all these things together and create this public art uh, piece that people could enjoy. Next slide. Right, geodesic dome. I was going to make my own. You'll see what happens. Next slide. The compound eyes of a fly or a dragonfly. You know, these are amazing. They're seeing all these different views at the same time and almost in a way around the corners because of the way their eyes are oriented. Uh, there, there, there are many hundreds of eyes are oriented. They can see you around corners. That's why you can never slap them because they can see you from a million miles away. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so that's a close-up. I also love this idea of, you know, the Fibonacci code of how it grows, um, these eyes, the pattern of it, like the bottom of a pineapple or a pine cone, the golden mean, if you know. Next slide. And these mirrors. I've always been fascinated by these mirrors. This idea that you can see around a bend. It's almost like, uh, like a, 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 an extra sense. It, it makes your senses even greater, your sight, your perception. I think that's what really intrigued me about them. Next slide. So I was thinking, okay, the compound eyes of a dragonfly and these mirrors, that's what we're going to create. You know, it's almost like um, um, Argus, you know, the many-eyed guardian of the Greeks in the myth. Next slide. And then an anemometer. I love those, you know. They do the wind speed. You see them at weather stations. I just... It's, it's in a way similar to aspects of uh, the fish wheel now. I have these sort of uh, Sputnik cones on the front of the fish and they move with the wind. Anemometer, next slide. And a bowl. So the, the big version of the sculpture would use this Ikea salad bowl as the means of uh, uh, the wind catching it and turning it around. Next slide. That's, this is the orientation. <laughs> this is the orientation that the salad bowl would be to catch the wind. Next, next slide. And this is the maquette of this sculpture. It's 11 by 15 feet high. Um, the point actually makes it a little bit higher. So you see the capital dome that's in there. You see the salad bowls. You see the compound eyes, the mirrors. Underneath it is the biodome of Buckminster Fuller. And uh, this, this actual Maquette is about 12 inches by 15 inches. Now, the next slide has a very short video of it being turned uh, with some air from a pneumatic. So, next slide, yeah. Now, imagine that 11 feet, 15 feet high. You'd be looking at yourself spinning. So, not only would it be showing you all the environment behind you and to the sides, but it also be showing you in these mirrors. So you and the landscape are united in this giant, almost like Dalek like shape of a, of a stupa spinning around. And again, it's, it's kind of like, <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous, but also magical. I, I would love to see this. Um, and I love the idea of the wind turning it even beyond, uh, you know, people not being there. People can engage it. There would be handles where you could pull it around in a circle, but also on its own. It would be gleaming golden, showing the world as it was spinning. Next slide. So, um, COVID, sheltering in place. It was really a time that I was germinating. But this was something that I was involved in. This was a show at the Highland Arts Center in Greensboro, way up north. And this was um, organized by an artist. I'm sorry, my, her name is Flying uh, Ewing. Um, it's okay. She did a wonderful job putting this together. And there was a lovely soundscape that went with it. And she basically asked artists all over Vermont to create a little house that was eight ounces or less. No, it was very much lighter than that. And it had to be some version of a house or the symbology of a house. And they created these beautiful ashwood saplings and the light 
and it was a wonderful project to be a part, uh, not just because of all the different artists and collaboration, but it really jump-started uh, my creative act again. I was, as many people, just extremely subdued and low and anxious during this time of this horrible virus. And um, I'm very grateful for this. So that's my little house there on the right-hand side. Uh, the blue, rich, rich blue. And then the patina of the copper um, that I used um, with copper sulfate and a blowtorch and then, and then beeswax to keep it from going any farther. The roof is made of old newspaper that I found in the walls of, of my renovated house. And they were from 1918, right around the time of the influenza. So I thought it was a really beautiful circle, time circle that happens there, that happened. Next slide. This is the mural that I did at Roots Restaurant. And I just wanted to show it because it was just so much fun. Again, this is one of these things that I was just like, yes, you know, trapped in my house, but I can do this. We had uh, one wall, this was the mural project. They had multiple different artists come in and paint walls. And then two weeks later, more artists would come in, paint over and do another mural, all in the restaurant while people were eating. Really good combination of, of both um, uh, a business and uh, the, the creative act. So I didn't know what I was gonna do. I had a vague idea. I went in there and I soaked these great big sponges with black watery paint and just threw these sponges at the wall. And then I, you could see some of the dots. And then I came in with the sponges that just did these great big whooshes with my arms, like windmilling my arms around. Very close up, so I couldn't quite tell what was happening. This is the base that I started with. Next slide. And then I moved into, I started to, you know, I, I defined the swoops and the splotches more. And then I started giving myself rules like, okay, now the gray paint goes in between all the black parts, but the gray paint cannot touch the black. Next slide. All right, so you see that. And I think I didn't get a lot of in-between stages, but from there, what I start doing is that I start moving into blue. And then the blue had to be within the gray and could not touch the black or the white. And then it moved on to white and the white was within the blue and it could not touch any of the gray or the white. They were in there, so it was island after island after island. And yet it feels like everything is together and swirling about. Next slide. Yeah, boom. So this is this is where this is where it ended, um, and you you can see the 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 gray within the white, the blue within the gray, and the white within the blue. Um, and then there was this window. So at one point, I had an image where I'm I'm in the window, and I think that's what it was for this artist talk. And I, I was just joking around, like I broke the fourth wall where some of these black tendrils are actually going to the fire, uh, you know, alarms and the thermostat on the sides, on the left-hand side. Next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna go on sabbatical in the fall, which is extremely exciting after 11 years of straight teaching, which has been wonderful, but it's also very good to recharge your batteries. And like I said, um, I was really germinating in this time. These are kind of what my sketches are like. They're very quick. It's sort of a, an idea of a shape of a form this is another great example of a functionalist machine. But I sort of like remind myself, okay, the glass line goes here. This could be wood or steel. This is gonna be glass. That's gonna be copper, possibly bronze, limestone, main force. This is gonna be copper. And I get this idea of what it's gonna look like. Next slide. Athenor. This is a piece I've wanted to do for at least 15, 15 years. Uh, an Athenor is an alchemist oven that heats up and combines different materials together. Uh, in a way, it's it's this symbolic idea of an assemblage, but also ideas, disparate ideas coming together to a united whole. Um, it's going to be kinetic. It's going to have a wheel that turns. Then you have these kind of plumb bob shapes that are going to spin around. It's also on wheels, so you can move the whole thing. Um, this is as far as it's gotten. But these how, how these are how these sculptures uh, become. Next slide. Yeah, so these are some other ideas. This is a large uh, sort of circular closet piece where you can open it up inside each closet. There are different items that are placed, very much like the God box. Uh, there are two steps that you go up, but you can also enter it. One of the closet doors has a false wall and you can go into the center 
And the center again is like the God box. We have all these different things, items that are on the outside, ways to communicate as well as sound. Uh, probably claustrophobic people would not be happy about this piece. Again, this is in its infancy. And the left is a straight up sculpture that's based on a poker, but also that menor shape, this idea of a, um, a king's scepter, a scepter of power. But again, who, what, what power? What, what are we, exactly are we talking about? Next slide, there we go. So I ask you, this is a picture of me in my box. Ah, help me, I'm stuck in a little box, little black box. Um, <laughs> that was a lot of fun. That doesn't exist anymore, but I'm glad to have gotten the picture. Maybe that's also the ephemeral quality of, of how you should be with your artwork. Just let, let it be, let it fly the nest. So I ask you, uh, members who have listened to me this, this whole time, are there any questions that you have? I have one. What's Emily, your favorite? Yes. <laughs> what's your favorite piece that you did? Whoa. No, that, that's unfair. That's really very difficult. And I'm sure it's, you know, you've heard this before. It's like asking, which is your favorite child? I, I don't, they're, they're also very different and they, they, they were created at a different time. Um, I would say the, my favorite pieces are the ones that are interactive. How about that? B, did I see, did you have a, a question? <laughs> I did. Uh, I, I, you said that during the pandemic, you were feeling kind of low. It's hard to imagine you without a creative idea <laughs> or not working. And I think I, hearing you talk, I know why I called you the Pied Piper, <laughs> because it's like completely, <laughs> it really fits you totally. <laughs> so do, did the I, pandemic do, really affect you? Um, well, it, it did, but it, it was also on top of it, they were, the, my father passed away right before. Oh. And, and so that was an emotional, a very huge thing. He had been ill for a while and I'd been caregiving him for a very long time. So it wasn't just that he had passed, it was this years of time that we would go back and forth from the hospital. I'd get a call or I'd just be there with him and holding him, you know, it was, uh, on top of on top of that, it was just it was mm. it was a lot. Um, oh, huge! Yeah. Uh, and then you know, with my mom too. So it was a it was a, it was just <laughs> I was completely overwhelmed, and it was everything just felt like a dead stop. Wow. And, and, as other people know, but this has happened to me before, not to this extent, but it has happened to before. So I was I had complete faith that it would come back. I just had to. Wait, and that's that sort of germinating, that, right. that time where you, you recharge, that it's going to spring forth again. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important time, that gestation. It's part of nature. Nature goes through a gestation period, too. And I've always marveled at how you could balance caretaking your parents, making art, and doing the incredible teaching that you do. <laughs> so I'm serious. You really deserve a sabbatical, and I hope you get a good one. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it a radical sabbatical. <laughs> that sounds perfect. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you so much. Um, Robert has a question. Oh, great. Is this Robert Shannon? Oh yeah, sorry. I think I just asked you to, oh, here you go. Oh, you go ahead. Bob, hi. Hi, I just wanted to say that having seen quite a bit of your work in bits and pieces over now quite a few years, since 2015, that yeah. to see it all together is very, very important, you know, to see the, the continuity and the ideas that are, you know, that flow from one to the other. And, um, and it's sort of how the skill develops over time in terms of being able to organize mm. uh, uh, difficult, difficult pieces that are not in any way related initially. Mm. Um, so I just, I think it's great to see this talk and I think you ought to have a book. You should be doing a book. <laughs> I would love to. Yeah, let's, 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 um, let's keep talking about that. I'll talk to you about it in 
May when I get back. Yeah, well, you, you have so much more experience in that aspect of things. It's great to see you, Bob. Yeah, I'm good to see you. Definitely. All right, who else? We're a little bit past eight, so I imagine everyone wants to go and enjoy their evening. Um, I would like to say again- Oliver? Everyone, yes. Hi. Bruce. Nice. Quick, quick question. Yeah. You, in the later part, you were, you were showing some of your drawings at, that you're planning to try and implement mm -hmm. into some new pieces. Um, how do you, is this something that you do commonly with the pieces? Because throughout the rest of the, the talk, you, were, you basically, it looks like you're assembling on the fly. You're, you're just sort of taking pieces and you're, and you're moving them around. This is how I work too, <laughs> as you know. Right. Um, so does this change the way you approach things or do you just uh, make these drawings based on things that you already know you have in, in situ, so to speak? Um, yeah, you know, honestly, Bruce, it's a combination of the two. So I'll, I will be, sometimes I will get um, a shape in my head and I'll sketch out the shape, but I have no idea where it's going. Um, and I manipulate, additive or subtractive, mm -hmm. carve something that will be that sort of base shape that's in my head. Other times I will come across a shape or an object that then starts the sculpture. But what happens is that in between, I will do a sketch to see what are the possibilities of this? What are the possibilities of that? So mm -hmm. it's a push pull between both the immediate and the planning. Yeah, there's always, it seems to be artists that, that uh, spend a lot of time preparing to create a piece and they do it in their sketchbooks and whatever. And then there are artists like yourself um, who manipulate materials probably more to that extent. I don't know. Um, I know that myself, you know, you know, we're both in the same genre. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I've moved away from the drawings more mm -hmm. towards the manipulation of materials. Yeah. And it's interesting to see you coming back to the drawing or maybe <laughs> another. Well, I don't know. I see the drawing <laughs> is kind of like putting a uh, bookmark in an idea. Mm -hmm. Because if I don't necessarily put it down on paper, um, not that it'll go away, but it'll, it'll morph, it'll, it'll grow or morph through time when I get to it. So I kind of just want to take a moment and record what it was I originally or thought, and then I can easily, I can relate back to it and easily riff off of it, but I'd like to know where it started from. Great. And that's what the drawings are about. Great. Nice. Yeah, Oliver. Um, yeah. I just wanted to comment on, on how you're moving towards the performances. I mean, you you perform when you teach. You perform when you when you let the um, audience participate. But I love it. I love the way you have the um, the found objects as a starting point, almost like throwing the 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 sponge of paint on the mural at at mm -hmm. Ruth. It's like it's just something to get started. Mm -hmm. And so much of the mechanical um, craft in order to make those things function is not a small you know, achievement. You have to have those skills in uh, metal working, woodworking, stone carving, copper, all of those materials really do require a whole lot of knowledge to be successfully done, that, done as sculpture and then be able to have the, the audience interact safely. Um, yeah, safely. <laughs> There's been some times, especially the, the, the fish wheel, I had to design a kind of fence that went around it where you could still interact with it, but you wouldn't have, you know, little, little kids just like running through and poof, oh, that was my worst nightmare. So it, it, there was a lot of um, uh, trial and error until it was, I mean, the, the mechanics are pretty rudimentary. So in, in a way, I like that because not only is it, it's, it's, there's not a lot of things to go wrong. You know, we're talking about very basic gears, but this is the sort of basis of our industrial revolution. And this idea of being 
able to turn wind power into lateral power. I just love those windmills. You know, I'm half Dutch, so of course I love the, the mechanics and the gears of things. And I also love men and working with all the different materials that you talked about. Yeah. I love I love the wood and stone and 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 metal and and just how it all combines together. All very different. Yeah. I also had a question um, yeah. in your roots um, mural. I was wondering about your method because you started off sort of abstractly and then sort of moved to. Um, kind of setting like rules for yourself. So I was wondering if that's something you just kind of took to that one specific piece or it's something that you've kind of like, it's like a pattern for your work? Huh, that's a good question. Um, I would say that I generally don't have rules when I'm working on a sculpture, but that piece was kind of specific. And it was the idea that, um, you know, COVID out of nowhere was thrown at us, right? And we had to live within these very tight parameters of our house and sheltering in place and wearing our masks and interacting with people. There were all these rules. So it was kind of based on that. The, the white couldn't touch the gray, the gray couldn't touch the blue. You know, all of this idea that it's all still moving around but none of it is actually touching each other. I think that's where I was going with that. But my sculpture, generally, I don't have any rules. Anything's a go. I mean, the, the rule is that I wanted to make it uh, aesthetically intriguing, <laughs> but that's about it, you know? I want to intrigue people. I want them to come up and want to go in, into close. Like, what is going on? What is that? You know, grab them just for a second. Only have a few seconds. How are you going to grab them? Any other questions? Excellent. Listen, thank you everyone so much for joining me in this and um, check out the next artist talk. This has been a wonderful series, Carol, at the Carving Studio and Sculpture Center. And um, uh, I, I thank you for inviting me to speak. Thank you, thank you. We really appreciate having you. Absolutely. And we'll see you all next uh, April 22nd. Great. Right. Bye. Thank you.